first, the apologies for date being wrong. This is uh, first time ever PowerPoint crash, and this is the PDF. And actually, it's the PDF for Tuesday, so the date is wrong. I've moved into the future. Um, which is probably a good thing because this is all about real time stuff. So me usually media lags. This time it's actually got itself three days ahead. Um, yeah, sadly without the bills, these aren't as good. Um, so I guess what I'd, my contention with this project, Media Streaming Mesh, which is a new open source project that we've spun up within Cisco, is that if you look at Kubernetes, and particularly if you look at the whole service mesh world, which gets, gets all the buzz in, in terms of Kubernetes networking, you know, it's very much focused in that kind of top left corner. If you think of things in a, a two by two matrix where you have non real time versus real time and interactive versus streaming. So web apps are very much there. And I guess you can think that kind of drives um, a lot of the scaling mechanisms like with horizontal scaling, because if it's interactive request response, you need more and more replicas to scale up. And that starts to get interesting if you think about streaming where you know, you have one source and you need to fan it out. So, so things start to, to get a bit different. So, so we came at this and said, well, we would quite like to do genuine real-time apps in Kubernetes. So typically media apps. Initially, we were kind of looking at gaming as well um, and things that are just UDP-based, but not necessarily media. But we've really narrowed down on media now. So anything that uses RTP, for those who know the RTP protocol. So one of the challenges there is that comes with a whole bunch of different control planes. So it could be SIP, it could be RTSP, it could be WebRTC, et cetera. And so you have to handle all those, all those different control planes. So that's, that's really where it's focused. And really what we're trying to do, um, and this is very early stages still, so we're not there yet. Um, so the goal is to really do everything that you would get from a service mesh, but do it for real-time apps. So you know, in terms of things like observability and security, that would be the classic kind of making sure that we export all the metrics, making sure that we can encrypt traffic such that you know, writing your app, you shouldn't have to care about that. If you want to turn on encryption authentication, that's a, a deployment issue, not, not a coding issue. Um, but you know, in contrast to service mesh, making it very low latency, so none of the kind of web prop things is all you know, effectively RTP proxies that are packet in, packet out, so there's no lag there. Um, and in terms of deployability, we started, I guess, from the edge. And the thing at the edge is, is you probably don't want, I think on voice, something like 40 megabytes per pod of overhead. And you may not want that if you're running on little cameras and things. I noticed the next talk, but one in here, I think, is actually about edge stuff and things like running Kubernetes on cameras. I think I'll come to that. So what we've done is we've looked at where, you know, where do we need code? Fundamentally, it's a per cluster control plane. Because Kubernetes, why do it on every pod or every node? Just do it once per cluster. Um, and then a per node data plane. I was mentioning the fanning out of media earlier. That's probably the right place to do it is once on each node, because then you get the optimal fan out. Um, I mentioned, yeah, that when we started, we were really looking at all of these use cases, including things like gaming, finance, et cetera, um, even mobile. But you know, really, as I say, we've, we've focused down on, on RTP. What's, what's kind of interesting is even some of those other things are running over RTP now. So one of my colleagues actually has a, an internet draft on using RTP for gaming updates. Because if you think about it, a lot of real-time games are actually quite like media. They, apparently, they send out their packets pretty much on a tick. So like one frame, almost like for each video frame, they'll send out a tick, and they'll send out pretty much the same data to everybody. Um, so there is, there is scope there. Um, and I suppose... You know, if you start to think about you know, the metaverse, sorry, I can't do the air fingers on camera, kind of, that's horrible. Um, you know, is it video, is it gaming? <sighs> I don't know. But yeah, so we focus very much on things like contribution videos, so that's the kind of studio stuff, um, live video distribution, um, the retail industrial edge, just mentioning the lower footprint, and that's really where we started. Um, we have demos on that, which I may or may not have time to show. And you know, real-time collab, so you know, WebRTC um, and all the sort of proprietary equivalents. So that's really where I see this, this playing. And, and really, a lot of that's around taking all those apps that it seems that a lot of those have yet to move over to the cloud-native Kubernetes kind of world. They're still running as virtual machines or on dedicated hardware. And so it's, it's making it easier to move that stuff over to, to cloud-native. So you think about it in terms of live video, and I may be completely wrong because I'm not a video person. The guys at the back can probably comment better. But you, know, you have your camera feeds coming in. They could be SDI, so digital feeds straight from the camera. It might actually be IP. Um, you're then going to mix that. You want to encode it in different bit rates and resolutions and et cetera. 
probably apply some kind of content protection. Typically, if you're delivering this over the top rather than over the air, you're going to want to fan it out to a bunch of CDN caches that will then do the final delivery to the user. Um, and I guess what starts to get interesting is can we go real time even right out to the user? So when I talk about that sort of two by two matrix at the beginning of real time and non real time, you know, if you're watching, it's kind of unfortunate, isn't it? Because it's, it's 3.15 in the UK, so I'm currently missing the FA Cup final. But I don't really care. But if, I, if I'm watching football, I have a, <laughs> the colleague I mostly work with on this is based in San Jose, but he's European too. So he, he and I both want to watch the football. We could be watching a game. I'm watching on cable. He's watching over the top. You know, I have to be really careful not to tell him that a goal's happened because he's not, he's not got there yet. So, so think about that as what we're trying to solve as we get, we get right to the edge. Um, and so those are the sort of use cases of each of those steps. I think the, the first one is probably a hard one because if you, you know, if you look at the desk over there, that's all dedicated hardware. That isn't a bunch of, you know, x86 compute running a bunch of containers. It's, it's actual physical cameras and physical mixing desks. That, that's pretty a challenge to virtualize. But certainly once we get to the encoding stage, you know, that's something that we should be able to do in a cloud native way. Um, and then as we fan that out to caches again, we should be able to address that. The final step really depends on protocols a bit, and I'll come on to that. So again, sorry about lack of animation in PDFs, but you know, really you can imagine your input stream coming in from effectively once it's coming out of the mixing desk and then flowing in through multiple transcoders, protection mechanisms, et cetera, that you might be doing at you know, different resolutions, different types of content protection. But again, it's the fact that proxy can fan stuff out and you can build pipelines. So one of the demos I have, you know, we build a pipeline where we literally have a fake camera. We feed that into something that recognizes somebody with a face mask off or on. We then re-encode it from motion JPEG to MPEG. You know, you can build these, these pipelines. You could have add encryption or whatever. So probably just running within a Kubernetes cluster. And then from there, probably distributing on towards the caches. And really, in, in that sense, you know, those egress, at the egress of that cluster, you can pull any of the streams you've got and fan those out to the caches. And I guess where it gets interesting is then can you start to do some of the things that we always did in the telco world, and I guess the media world does too, like making sure you have live live feeds, because you know, if one of your paths goes down, you don't want people's TV feeds to go down, you know, whether it's the FA Cup this afternoon or you know, heaven help us, Eurovision tonight. You, people are going to get upset if they lose whatever it is, 30 seconds of, of Eurovision. Um, and so that's where the sort of live life thing can happen. The various other content protection mechanisms like you know, adding forward error correction. Um, some of the demos I have, I do a really brain dead version. I just send every packet twice. And you see that you, know, you, can, you can run 10% packet loss and it appears to be 1% as long as the loss is random. Um, the final thing is streaming over quick to clients. I mean, that's, that's something we've prototyped. One of the challenges there is the standards aren't there yet. So there are various ways you can take RTP payloads and encode them over quick typically over quick datagrams rather than quick streams because, again, you don't want that sort of TCP-like error correction. The, the thing there is it seems like there's an awful lot of activity in that space. So if any of you follow some of the stuff happening in ITF in that space, um, you know, Facebook, Twitch, everyone's got these different drafts at the moment on things like sending each video frame on a separate quick media stream or sending them over datagrams. Um, it may be that you completely bypass something like RTP. And so there's a draft from one of my colleagues at Cisco called Quicker. Um, and the, the goal there is really to create a sort of pub sub mechanism within Quick that could either be used with error correction or without. So I think it's a watch this space. Um, as I say, we can, we can run it now with RTP over Quick. And I guess the hope is that we can get that into browsers. Because once it's Quick and browsers run Quick, then you know, there's an opportunity there. But of course, actually, that's the other thing to mention is that, you know, I've shown, a, I've shown a computer and a tablet here, but of course, if people are watching the football, the problem is that most likely they're actually watching it on a big, you know, Samsung or Sony or whoever TV. And can you get the vendors of all those TVs or all the set-top boxes to upgrade to what you need? So there's a real sort of lag that you're likely to have there in terms of eliminating the lag. So video monitoring, again, this one suffers from lack of build, but the... The use case here, so there's probably two sort of extremes to it. One is, um, like a lot of you, I came through the airport this morning. You go through an airport and there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of security cameras all in one giant sort of super campus. 
And what you might want to do is have a separate monitoring center. So say you're at Heathrow, you've got four terminals active, but you might have a separate monitoring center, could be on site, could be off site. Um, and there might be lots of people in there, there might also be analytics apps. So what you want is that each feed from any of the given cameras, it might be that nobody's really watching it, you're just storing it or something. But it might be somebody's watching it live, but also an app's consuming it, so you actually have to send it to two different locations. And it seems that what a lot of deployments do today is they use UDP multicast. So if you go into your um, camera, if you have one of those little uh, RTSP type cameras, you can say, oh, I want to run RTSP, or you can literally say, I just want to RTP multicast it, and it'll just fire it out as a multicast. The problem with that, as a network person, is you end up injecting state into your network to run multicast, which is never a great idea. And so really, from a network administration point, it would be much nicer to have these proxies, basically put them near where the cameras are, put them near where the viewers are, and then do the replication through the proxies. The other extreme of that could be, you know, imagine coffee shops. So if you're, you know, whoever you are, Starbucks or somebody, you're going to have thousands and thousands of coffee shops, but you're only going to have one or two cameras in each. But again, you might not want to have people watching them in the store because they're too busy making coffee. You might want people in a, in a central location. So how are we building it? So as I mentioned before, open source project, we are literally building this now. So um, I'll be coding away this week. Um, we've built some of these. Now. Apologies for the terrible use of color. That's fixed on the PowerPoint, which you can't see because it crashes because of the projector. Um, but yes, <laughs> that one says media streaming mesh stub, um, the, the dark one. Um, so we've built a bunch of these components already. It's the stub injector, the CNI plugin. We're currently writing the stub, the control plane. We've got to build the proxy next. We've got to the point where everything works, but we just need to put a proxy in. Um, but we know how to do that. Um, so first, the stub injector, this is something that when I, when I started this project, I was just doing it on my own, not really a Kubernetes expert. So I was doing things like I was just manually injecting like a sidecar container into my pods. Uh, the initial demo used a sort of full fat sidecar that I'd built of an RTSP proxy. We're now decomposing that. But that meant that obviously in my YAML files, I had to have a whole bunch of stuff saying, okay, throw this sidecar in every pod, and it's a bit of a pain. And so what the stub injector does is it just looks for an annotation on the pod, and if that annotation's there, then it automatically injects the sidecar. Or in the case of the, the new architecture, it's a little stub. The other thing you have to do, though, on every pod, and this is where the CNI plugin comes in, is you need a bunch of IP tables rules, because those are going to intersect the traffic, the same as, again, you would do with Envoy. So we intercept, like, so for RTSP, you'll intercept TCP port 554 and direct it into the proxy. So it's putting in those rules. And so again, just automating all of that. And this is a chain plugin, so it, you, know, you can still run Calico or Cilium or whatever your CNI is. This one just gets chained in to do that one specific job. So again, just the annotation, and then everything happens for you. The other plus there is you don't have to run privileged. When I was doing all this manually, I was having to run these pods privileged. So the control plane we've just built. Um, so yeah, we run effectively one instance per cluster. It might be in the end we'll figure out how to do proper redundancy where we have kind of three of these running and you know, then there's always a control plane there. I guess that's where you get into some of these interesting architectural discussions like, do you want to synchronize state for every client all the way through the process? Or are you happy to say, well, if I'm trying to watch a video and I'm going through the kind of setup play and I haven't quite got to play and the control plane dies, I'm going to try again. So maybe we care more about once the video's up and running, then we'll make sure we sync it so that there's less, less kind of chattiness going on. So a lot of that we're still discussing. Fundamentally, what we do is we use the Kubernetes API um, and the DNS so that you know, we can do URL routing. Longer term, we might implement XDS so that we can do kind of virtual service model. Um, and fundamentally, that, that control plane will have to have an instance of it for each of the sort of, I mentioned earlier, RTSP, SIP, et cetera. We'll need an instance for each. We've done RTSP so far, but the way we're writing it obviously is a framework where we just plug in that individual control plane. All the sort of infrastructure is already there. And talking of infrastructure, we've written writing this in Golang, and the goal is to use existing libraries as much as possible. So there's a library already, for example, for RTSP, go RTSP lib. So we just pull that in and then write code on top of it. Um, everything's gRPC, so we talk gRPC to the stub, which is the thing you can't quite see on the right-hand side. Um, and then we also use gRPC to program the RTP proxy, basically to put in forwarding rules. So to say, 
you know, when the packet arrives on this port, you're going to send it to that destination. And of course, because this is media that we can fan out, you might be saying send it to all these destinations. So the stub, um, somewhat killed again by the lack of animation. Um, I called it a stub just because it's really small. It's just literally something we put in each, in each pod, like a sidecar proxy, but all it's really doing is terminating the control plane sessions from apps and tunneling them to the control plane. So you'll have a little TCP connection from each app typically, and then we have one gRPC connection with bidirectional streaming to the control plane that we can send, send things over. So it doesn't actually look at what's going on on the control plane. So you know, we're doing RTSP so far. My stub doesn't know what RTSP is. It just knows it receives something over TCP and effectively punts it to the control plane. For RTSP, what we may need to do, though, is the intercept, intercepting the data plane, because there's an option in RTSP to do all of that over TCP. And that's where we might sort of have a thin layer of it, sort of getting closer to the app. Normally, what we'll do is we'll just basically poke a rule into the kernel to fire stuff out of the pod and into the, into the proxy. Um, again, this is where we may do things like authentication with Spiffy Spire. Um, it may be there's other stuff we want to do here. So if you think of that live, live case, if you're super, super paranoid, you might want to do it right from the pod rather than on the node. But I say the footprint's very minimal. Um, I've written this in Rust. It's probably, I don't know, 500 lines or something. So it's, fair, it's fairly small. We wrote it there just to want to keep the footprint low, keep the latency low, particularly in those cases where we intercept the data plane. And that's, I think that's one of the things that's going to be interesting as we push this forward is like, up to now, we've always just assumed that we're running on top of a regular CNI and everything's good. What might get interesting is if you're doing, you think of like a 4K video stream that's uncompressed, that's about 10 gigabits. You might not be willing to lose a single packet. You really want to pump that through your CNI. So it's going to be interesting to figure out how that, how that all works. Um, then the RCP proxy, which is to say we're literally about to start writing. Um, Fundamentally, it's just going to terminate RTP and then forward packets on. But what that's sort of the easy bit in a sense, um, and that gives you the ability to sort of translate from v4 to v6 and unicast to multicast, etc. But I think what's going to be interesting is the filter chain. I'll come on to that on the next slide, what that is. And that's, you know, I guess with an open source project, that's the interesting bit is how do, how do we build a community? And I'm, I'm useless at this. I mean, I'm not. I think it's the first open source project I've ever spun up. So... If you're going to work on something, then you have to have a way to contribute. So, for example, while we were sort of experimenting, figuring out what we were doing here, I looked at, you know, I mentioned gaming earlier. Google have a proxy out there called Quilkin that's specifically for games. And it's basically just a UDP proxy written in Rust. And the first thing I did was I went and had a look at that, and I wrote a filter for it to do, um, like, hashed load balancing. And that was fairly easy to do. And I could do that with a sort of fairly minimal understanding of the project. I could know enough to write that filter. And I guess that's where we want to drive at with this, is that whether you're writing filters for the data plane or whether you're writing porting in control planes, you shouldn't have to know so much about the infrastructure of the project. You can focus on that, on the functionality you're putting in. Um, yeah, and we, obviously we want this to work with multiple control planes. We might spawn, spawn multiple instances, but we haven't you know, really had a chance to look at that yet. So fundamentally, in terms of how it works, you know, the packets will come in, we'll strip off the transport layer headers. Usually it's going to be UDP, but then maybe this you know, RTP over quick or even over TCP. And then with a the filter chain, you'll effectively build that filter chain dynamically for what you need to do. So typically you'll do things like adding error correction, fanning the packets out, adding encryption, etc. And then finally it'll flow out to your clients. And so you know, it might be, for example, um, you want to do stuff like validate that your endpoints are all correct and that nobody's attacking you. And so you might do things like checking the SSRCs and the SDES on your, on your RTP streams. So again, you can write those plugins if there are things you particularly want to address. I was going to do a demo. This is like that, that moment of live, live craziness. Let's check it's actually... Just to prove it actually exists. So... Because this is where you find my VPNs drops. No, it hasn't. So I have a whole bunch of stuff running. This is a, there are three nodes in this cluster. Um, and you can see a bunch of, a bunch of components running. Um, this is where I was just using a full fat sidecar. So this is running in San Jose. So there's a fair bit of round trip time. What I don't know at the moment is how much, um, 
latency we're going to see. So, for example, I have one setup where I'm going through Envoy, so this is all going to run over TCP. And it may eventually get there. Again, if there's packet loss, you'll see it. It'll freeze sometimes and that kind of stuff because this is all TCP. It may not even get there. Haha, <laughs> yes. <laughs> does, that, does that mean the network's that bad at the moment? Either means the network's that bad at the moment, or, or I've broken it. I really should have run a demo that runs on the machine. Oh, that seems okay. That's very important. Oh, there you go. Yeah, and this one that's running very on a very lightweight VM, unfortunately, so I didn't have enough resource to throw in the um, face mask detection because that's an AI app, and it, like all these things, it just uses a ridiculous amount of resource, and this is a very skinny VM. Um, and you can see this is just running over over UDP, and so it's fairly, yeah, you know, it should be fairly stable. Um, I could probably prove that by doing a. Uh, what are we going to do? Yes, you can see it's all coming in over UDP. Um, I don't know why the TCP one decided not to play ball. I'll give it one more go. Ah, it does work. Oh, no, it's fallen through. So for some reason, that one's died, which is super annoying. There is one more option, which is... run it through cube proxy rather than running it through um, rather than running through envoy proxies just run it through cube proxy and even that the problem running through cube proxy you'd think that UDP would work because it's just mapping ports but it doesn't work because the control basically all these protocols like RTSP how they work is you have a separate TCP channel that does all of the kind of control plane and then what it does is it negotiates your UDP ports dynamically on that control channel and so, of course, if you're just proxying one port, you can't spot that stuff going on, which is why we had to build our own proxies. Now, this, you probably will see some odd freezes. It does depend to some extent on the quality of the network. Um, and what we can also do if we want for demos is do things like um, deliberately add loss. But you can see, yeah, there's a bit of glitching there. Um, what I haven't yet, yet done, I suppose, is show it with a football match and prove that, <laughs> prove that we can get the latency down. And really, you know, ultimately, we know that real-time works on the internet, right? Because you know, we know we can run Zoom and WebEx and everything, and it works fine. So we know that's all good. So the question, I guess, is how do we get the cost down? And I guess my contention there is if we can get all that stuff into the cloud-native world and use all the same tools, all the same skill sets that we use for our web development, then hopefully that will let us push the cost down to a point that all that stuff becomes doable at the right cost points. Because, you know, again, for me, it's unacceptable if I watch the football, but I have to lag 30 seconds. That seems, and in fact, an indeterminate length. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an open source project. Um, we would really love people to get involved and help. Um, and so, uh, there you go. Um, that should be... Yeah, so we have a website up. We've, it's all on GitHub. We're only gradually leaking things out into public uh, repos at the moment. Some of them are still private, but I think the goal would be over the next few weeks, we're really going to start ramping that up and getting it out there. Um, so it'd be great to have people involved. So we're coding it in Rust and Go so far, but you know we're pretty agnostic as to how we do stuff. You know, it's very much an architecture, and it's a question of you know working with, hopefully building a community to figure out the right way to do it.